All right, this is the 20th of October, 2015. We are at the University of Georgia. We are interviewing Seth Hendershot. My name is Isaiah Fagan, and I'm joined by... Deborah Caldwell. And let's get this going. Um, so let's, let's learn a little bit about you. So where are you from? Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And how did your family end up in Hackettstown, New Jersey? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't know, really. My, my father was uh, from Pennsylvania. My mother was from Alabama. I think they met um, when my mother's family was visiting, visiting somebody um, in New Jersey in that area. And, you know, they, they weren't very... Uh, we've never we never had these long discussions about how they met the first time they kissed or any of that kind of stuff. Like they're just not mushy people, so I don't get a lot of that information. I certainly don't give a lot of it out. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like growing up there? Um, it was um, it, sort, sort of sort of, New Jersey's beautiful. It, it gets sort of a bad rap, but it, it truly is a garden state. Like it's it's there's a lot of. Uh, gorgeous landscape in New Jersey. Unfortunately, I didn't live in that area where there was gorgeous landscape. We lived in this small town that was sort of surrounded by rural uh, cornfields, basically. Um, but the town was was kind of dirty and just a little sort of you know redneckish, I guess, um, uh, as as redneck as Yankees can get. Um, which is why we exited pretty quick, I think. My dad was a uh, letter carrier up there, a postman, a mailman. Um, he walked his route. He was great. He, he worked, uh, worked very hard to provide for us. And my mother was a secretary at the little Christian school I went to. We were um, uh, ardent churchgoers, very religious family. Um, we grew up in an Assembly of God church, which was sort of in a you know, pulpit-beating, guilt, fear-driven <laughs> Uh, religious, religious sect, um, and it was small, but and it had a, a, a school attached to it. It was about sixty-five kids in there, um, so it was pretty sheltered. And we grew up uh, fairly naive to the rest of the world and what was going on in it. Um, a lot of backmasking of rock and roll records and just trying to scare the bejesus out of us, if you will, um, and not listen to rock and roll, secular music, and just you know, stick to the Christian stuff, the contemporary Christian stuff, which in the early 80s was really horrible. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of vocal groups, um, which are fine, you know, in, in, in some context, but um, not, not in the contemporary religious world. It was really hard to listen to. Um, my father was a sort of a recovering hippie, I guess, um, as was my mom. Uh, dad was in Vietnam. I uh, was in the Air Force. He actually was in Vietnam uh, watching the blips on the radar and telling people where to bomb other people. So I think he lived with a lot of guilt. He never talked about that too much. Um, uh, in fact, the, the only time I've ever seen him cry was when he was watching a uh, sort of a, I guess it was a news piece about Vietnam, um, you know, people still exiting or whatever in the late 70s, uh, really broke him up. And uh, that was about as much as I got out of it. I knew it bothered him, but I didn't know much about it. But um, anyway, he was, he was, uh, um, not, he didn't go to college. Uh, he was drafted. Um, mom didn't go to college either. Uh, he, they lived in Key West for a little bit where he was stationed and then made their way back up to New Jersey. Um, and uh, had three of us. I have an older sister and a younger brother. And um, we lived there for, uh, I guess, about 12 or 13 years of my life. And then headed south for promise of a better life. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned about uh, kind of backhandling uh, rock records, and that was the music you weren't supposed to listen to. So, oh, yeah. did you manage to get your hands on some? I did. Um, I uh, I think that's why I brought up that my dad was a recovering hippie. He had a he had a great record collection, and he had a bunch of rock and roll records. Um, a big one for me that I always turned to was Beach Boys, and I think he thought the Beach Boys were safe enough. You know, we're surfing USA. We're um, uh, you know, run around suit or not run around suit, but uh, uh, little these dudes, you know, whatever their their tunes were about cars and surfing and chicks, um, and and amazing uh, layered harmonies, uh, which is I think my first exposure to uh, vocal harmony and and um, just uh, um, 
texture, sonic texture and stuff. You know, they had a really, really cool um, and, and progressive way of presenting that. Brian Wilson, I think, uh, is one of the great innovators of, of rock and roll and um, certainly incorporating a lot of classical elements into rock and roll um, just in, in his design of uh, vocal production. Uh, it was really unique and I got a lot from that. Uh, so yeah, I was able to sneak that stuff, the safe stuff. You know, he'd let me hit Beach Boys, he'd let me hit Richie Valens, um, what were some other things. Uh, I think as, as, as crazy as uh, we got with his albums were probably the Beatles, like that was as out, but nothing, nothing past Revolver, you know, that was getting a little too risque. <laughs> um, and then Christian Rock sort of started developing at that point. And as I grew older, I became more interested in that. Um, there was a couple bands like Petra and the Resurrection Band and Striper. <laughs> Striper changed my life. Um, I discovered heavy metal through Striper and, and got really interested in that and the glam aspect and the, the big concerts they threw and, um, and actually had to defend them to the, the church and the school, you know, even though they were spreading the uh, message of, of uh, God and the Holy Spirit through heavy metal music. Uh, they had long hair, man, and they wore tight pants and they it made girls feel a certain way, I think. And it probably made boys feel a certain way. <laughs> and so the church was not down with Striper. So I had to, uh, I had to actually write a paper on why it was okay for me to listen to Striper to, this, to the principal of the school who was also the son of the pastor. Um, and, you know, took a couple paddlings for things like that, you know. <laughs> That's how it went. So that was the kind of stuff that your, uh, your father let you listen to. What kind of music did your family listen to? Uh, just to, in, around the house, just in general, or were they? Um, were they to there music? was a lot of that. My my mom, uh, God bless her, had horrible taste in music and would wake us up Saturday morning. Um, very vivid memories of her vacuuming. Uh, we lived in a very small house. It was one bathroom. It was five of us. It was cramped, uh, but it was you know it was fine. It was home. We loved it. Uh, but she would wake us up to uh, vacuuming and listening to Tammy Faye Baker records which is the worst music on the planet, um, but in, in the best way. It's the worst in the best way. Um, her album cover was always her dolled up in some minks and furs and stuff and <clears throat> lots of makeup. You know, she was the classic mascara running, crying um, preacher's wife, you know, and she had these awful records that mom would just crank at full blast. Um, songs like We're Blessed and uh, Through the Blood of Jesus and things like that we would wake up to and just kind of, you know, recoil in horror and go down and just hope there was some kind of sugar cereal to take the edge off, like a Fruity Pebbles or something usually uh, was trumped by some bland Cheerios or, you know, whatever. We were able to scarf up. Um, and then uh, uh, Dad, you know, he, he was into, he would let, like I said, he let me listen to Beach Boys and things like that. So he, he was down with that still. He was, you know, he was probably like the, the center of the bunch, you know, listening to some of his 60s stuff, um, a lot of the Woodstock, late 60s Woodstock era stuff. Um, Steppenwolf, you know, I'd catch him listening to Steppenwolf and take it off the needle real quick, you know, when I walked in the room. He's supposed to be setting a good Christian example for me. So that was, that was a lot, of, uh, we were exposed to a lot of that and a lot of tons of contemporary Christian music, whether it hymns um, in the church, uh, which was another cool uh, sort of unique way I think to discover um, harmony and melody and rhythm uh, the, the old hymnal book man and just looking at the notes on the page which I didn't understand uh, but could see that the words were kind of following this these little black dots and then there were flags on them and things and there was a guy that always sat behind us that always sang the bass part because it was his favorite part and uh, so I got to hear these you know kind of pretty simple but um, cool little layers of, of music and it was neat. It was. It was a. I think a. I think it helped. Uh, helped me develop into you know, having more diverse taste as an older musician. How did that soundscape change whenever your family moved to Georgia? Well, first, how, how did your family come to move to Georgia? Um, we basically my my uncle uh, who was like a CEO for Ortho uh, made a ton of money and. I think he was somebody that my dad sort of looked up to and admired and wanted to sort of emulate a little bit. Um, he had moved his family to Gwinnett County, 
uh, when Gwinnett in the late 80s, Gwinnett County was a suburb of Atlanta that was really growing and uh, there was all these planned you know, John Whelan home neighborhoods and everything was white and good and safe and you know the kids were going to get a good education and you know um, they uh, that appealed to him because we were uh, my sister started smoking in, in like ninth grade and cursing and I, I started you know kind of hanging out with the public school kids and, and we were just heading down this what they presumed to be a darker path and um, were just ready to get us out and uh, get us down there because I think my uncle had convinced my father that um, you know, it was just safer down in Georgia. You know, things were better as a Baptist man. <laughs> um, so he easily transferred his mailman job from Washington, New Jersey to uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia and came on as a sub and he, uh, he moved down about a year before us because we were trying to sell the house and he would come back and visit occasionally but he stayed with my other aunt and uncle, who were like the liberal, uh, cool city aunt and uncle, who you know would um, foster inner city kids. They had two children of their own, and they were, you know, in public schools, and they were, you know, friends with black people, and just all this crazy liberal stuff that I think my dad secretly wanted to uh, be a part of. Uh, whereas my other uncle and aunt um, were the more conservative, you know. Christian white people that lived in the suburbs and didn't stray from the path. Um, so he stayed with the two of them for a year while we tried to sell the house and he was a sub mailman and he delivered pizzas for Domino's and just waited on us to get down there and we moved and um, moved into this what I thought was a, a mansion man. It had two bathrooms and three bedrooms and it was brick and it was a yard and a deck and a fireplace. It was rad man. It was great. Um, so we were all enamored with that, and we got to go to public school, and we actually stopped going to church completely, um, which was crazy. Uh, but my dad was friends with a guy at the post office who was um, a graduate of Georgia State Percussion Department with Jack Bell, and he taught drum lessons, and my dad knew I had an interest, and so uh, we, uh, you know, I sort of got it. I think I'm getting ahead here, but um, I got into uh, taking formal drum lessons that way. I will back up and say when I was eight, uh, some, some of the church friends of ours uh, were going on a mission trip to Italy and they were gonna save Italian souls or something. And uh, the, the middle son, who was one of my best friends, had a drum set and he couldn't bring it with him, so he gave it to me and that was sort of my first exposure to becoming a percussionist. And, um, I took to it right away and loved it and had kind of sort of kind of a knack for it. And, um, I took a couple lessons from the guy that played at our church, and then we moved, and I hooked up with this, you know, sort of formal drum teacher. So, what was uh, what types of music did you first started playing whenever you first started? Um, when we got down south, all bets were off. Um, my parents loosened up. We got we weren't going to church anymore. Sundays we were sleeping in. It was insane, um, and I could listen to secular music. My dad let me get. You know, or he just kind of, I don't know if he let me get or just kind of stopped caring uh, at what my musical tastes or choices were. Um, and I went straight for the hardest, darkest thing I could. You know, heavy metal was big in the, in the mid 80s, glam rock and metal. And, and it was fast and it was really technical and I loved it. And there was all kinds of um, uh, different influences that were coming into it. And so I just went full bore into that and started playing that, that stuff pretty heavily on the drums, you know, a lot of fast double bass pedal, 30 second note driven stuff, <laughs> it was, you know. Not the, uh, not the most complex style of music, but certainly had um, a sophistication to it. That I, I, the precision, I think, was what I liked a lot about it. So what types of things did you work on in your, in the, professional lessons or in the, the private lessons that you're taking? Um, the more formal stuff, I, and, and since, we get, since we were able to go to, to public school, I immediately joined the, the middle school band um, in seventh grade. And so my lessons were basically just fed that, like I learned how to read, um, you know, music notation, and uh, learned a lot of rudiments, and started working a little on um, marimba stuff, not, not a ton, but it was my first exposure to like melodic, you know, getting a little bit of ear training, a little bit of theory, um, but mostly I focused on the, the jock stuff, the rudiments and the, the 
you know, snare drum reed. What kind of things did the did the middle school band do? Was it a middle school marching band or was it a? No, it was just a concert band. Okay. Um, pretty standard. Um, you know, during Christmas we had a Christmas concert. We played Feliz Navidad. It was this really horrible out of tune. You know, uh, what 30, 40 piece um, concert band. And I was one of two percussionists. She had a shortage of percussionists. And it was actually April Bell, who was married to Jack Bell, who was the principal uh, percussionist for the Atlanta Symphony and the drum uh, uh, the professor of percussion at uh, Georgia State. So she was really excited to have, have me in there as the second percussionist uh, in the school. And um, I got some exposure to him as well. And he had some really amazing um, sort of theories and uh, on rhythm and, and technique and things that I got a little bit of exposure to. It was cool. So what came next after after middle school band? I, I assume high school band. High school marching band, <laughs> man, went straight in and was and loved it. Um, I um, auditioned and, and made the marching bass drum, which for a freshman was kind of rare. And then I, uh, right when band camp came around, I got mono and couldn't go to band camp. So I was uh, reduced to cymbals, you know, sort of cut, you know, and that was a, that was a blow to my, my little fragile male ego uh, that I had to play cymbals and there were three girls on the cymbal line and me and I was already kind of small and, and uh, probably more effeminate than some of the dudes there, um, you know, just not as big and tough and fast, um, but I could play. And so I, I did the cymbals, I did my best and I took that opportunity to learn everybody's part in the drum line and so I could, I could play the snare drum parts, and I could play the tenor parts, and I could play the bass drum parts, and um, sort of made my, you know, sort of made my bones that way. You know, got some respect from the older guys, and uh, and easily trans uh, transferred into marching snare drum the next year, which was kind of a a badge of honor, you know, as a tenth grader. That was that, that didn't happen, so it was cool. Was all of this uh, all the secular glam rock heavy metal stuff happening at the same time? Um, oh uh, yeah, so seventh eighth grade, all the all the glam rock things were happening, and um, uh, it it sort of got it, it got a little more sophisticated. Um, I started listening to the Police. I started listening to um, uh, what else was happening at that time musically for me. Um, I think I discovered. Uh, from the glam scene, we, we sort of transitioned into the LA um, sort of alternative rock was, was becoming a thing around that time, right? Like, well, Seattle and LA. Uh, so Seattle gave us Nirvana, which was huge, um, and Pearl Jam and, and Soundgarden. So we were hearing odd time signatures and, and different melodies and darker things, minor key, you know, stuff like that was kind of cool to hear. And then in LA, this band came out of LA called Fishbone, and um, I was done like that was my band I listened to those guys constantly I've seen them in concert hundreds of times um, they were a horn based sort of they did everything which is why I loved them they did ska they did reggae they did rock they did funk they did um, blues they did R&B they did uh, all, all these different great styles of music um, and they were a nine piece band eight piece band something like that they had trombone uh, trumpet or flugelhorn and um, saxophone, two guitars, keys, drums, lots of vocal, lots of gospel style vocal, like all this stuff was sort of happening inside that, that band and I got really excited about that music and wanted to just play that stuff, which was a lot of stuff. Um, but I think it helped sort of uh, uh, expose me to, to, to different styles. So by the time I got ninth, 10th grade, I was listening to jazz, I was listening to a lot of reggae, a lot of ska, um, a lot of um, R&B stuff, old R&B stuff, Billy Preston and War and bands like that, you know, like really starting to delve into um, a little more soulful kind of music, I think. Did you have any opportunities to play that style of music within a venue, to play with a group? Did you have a group back then? I did, yeah. Well, I, I had a band and it was sort of a metal rock band, you know, and it was me and this guitar player and we were the, we were best friends and we played music every day together and, and our our tastes were different a bit. Um, I was getting more into that stuff, and he was pretty strict, you know, Ozzy Osbourne fan or you know whatever he was listening to at the time. Um, but we we managed to make it work, and we were we were so close that um, uh, it didn't matter. We we just played whatever came out. Uh, but I was also introduced to um, this drum instructor who was the father of uh, two of the percussionists at the high school, um, and his name was John Lamatina. 
And he was from Long Island, New York, and anybody knows that that's like a hub for jazz musicians. And uh, we've seen many great players come out of that area, uh, certainly of Manhattan, but Long Island um, as well. Um, and so he was like the guy. He, everybody took lessons from him. I was no exception. Um, I went in and took some drum lessons, uh, drum set lessons from him. And then uh, his oldest son, Joe, was this probably the best percussionist I've ever seen, the best naturally gifted percussionist I've ever seen um, or heard. And he would teach more, you know, the rudimental stuff. So, and, and we were close enough in age where we were friends, but everybody knew like Joe was the man. So you, you just listened to what he had to say. And then his, you know, his father, John, was uh, teaching everybody big band swing and combo jazz and straight ahead stuff. And just like, oh, this really cool uh, music that we hadn't really gotten exposed to and getting us, you know, well, a couple of us, he would he would turn on to like big band rehearsals and let us go cover for him at a big band rehearsal. So we were getting um, exposure to that, like this formal sort of gig scenario, you know, not not the, hey, we're playing at the, you know, 10th grade Shadow High School talent show, like actually going to a big band rehearsal, reading charts and, and playing with these guys who were like curmudgeon 70 year old big band guys who didn't take anything from you know from a punk kid like you and you better show up knowing your stuff or they were gonna let you know how bad you were um, so that was really exciting and and really humbling because I did forget symbols one time when I showed up to rehearsal it was awful but uh, but it taught me a lot about like you know be prepared be on time um, you know show up ready to, to work you know it is work we call it playing but it is work um, and uh, so he was a really cool influence and, and just getting uh, that kind of exposure and those kind of opportunities, I think, were invaluable and very unique for, for some of us coming up in that program. So during that time period when you're kind of split between these two worlds of things within the school and things outside of it, um, uh, how, did you, how did you find the balance between the two and what did your, uh, uh, what did your family think about uh, being in both of those worlds? Um, my, my dad was freaked out about the, music, the, the glam stuff I was listening to. I had, you know, Poison and Motley Crue posters all over my wall. These guys, these sort of androgynous guys, you know, who at the time um, uh, were, were like sex symbols, you know. They're wearing makeup and they have huge hair and they use a bunch of Aquanet in their head, you know, and tight clothes and all this stuff. And it was really bizarre, you know, it was born sort of of the, um, the Bowie, Brian Eno era. Um, stuff from the 70s, uh, but, it, but it was way more hardcore and there was a lot more cocaine and, and, and sex and things, you know, that, that probably uh, I, w I certainly wasn't aware of. I was more into the music and the look was, I didn't care. I was like, all right, you know, these guys are doing their thing. I wasn't, I certainly wasn't dressing up and putting on makeup and things to kind of freak my dad out. Um, but he saw the posters on the wall, got a little concerned. Um, but uh, to me, I, it, it was about the music and, and, and the, um, the scene was romantic, you know what I mean, in a, in a, um, in a sort of far off distant way. I was enamored with the scene because I, I couldn't do that. I wasn't allowed to do that, so I was, of course, drawn to it. Uh, but later on, when we got, um, when we got more into the, uh, the more technical stuff, Rush, was a big thing. Um, I failed to mention them. Uh, yeah, Police, Rush, Dave Weckl, guys like that. When I was getting more into the technical side of it um, and the more sort of sophisticated music side of it, I think he, he got a little more excited about that, you know, and he could see that I could play and that I was uh, making my mark a little bit, you know, in the school and in the, the gigging world. Um, and I think he got kind of like proud dad, you know, at that moment, less frightened. Uh, but the balance was, uh, was easy for me. I, I didn't see a problem with it, you know? Mm. I, I thought the two fed into each other. I thought, um, you know, why not, uh, why not be exposed to all this? It's all, you know, sort of on the same mission, right? We're all just trying to make art at the end of the day. I mean, it's just, whether it's C.C. DeVille and his pink eyelashes and, and big white hair, uh, he still loves music and he's playing things that are in the, uh, the scope of music theory and, and um, what we consider, uh, uh, you know, staying in the, in, in the box, you know, staying in bounds and, and playing scales and everything worked. And, and so why isn't that as valid as, uh, you know, Buddy Rich's big band playing uh, 
you know, uh, whatever, I can't think of the name of a song right now, but uh, playing their stuff, you know, it, it all is the same. It's all, most of it's in a major key and most of it uh, works musically um, together and, and it's rhythmic and it's harmonic and it's melodic and it's got all the elements, right? So I didn't see a problem. And that's, I think, why I love that band Fishbone so much is because they didn't see a problem with it either. And they, they married all those styles. So it was, it was cool. So you mentioned gigging. What, what, was, what was your first, like, real gig, your first, like, or first performance, I guess, just to preface it by, when did you feel like it was your first real gig? Like, when did, when did you realize, oh, I'm doing it, I, this yeah, is yeah. it. Yeah, that, uh, that was a gig from, uh, from John Lamatina, from one of the instructors. He, he gave a guy my number, um, which, you know, to hear him talk in his, in his Long Island accent, you know, it was like, made a big impression, you know, oh, this guy's gonna call you about a gig. I learned the word gig. I was like, man, this palindrome is great. Um, and he gave a guy my number, and uh, the guy called me to come play this, like, outdoor, uh, you know, Grayson Fall Festival or whatever. Um, and they had a stage, and they had a big sound system, and Tommy Lasorda was gonna be there, the manager of the Dodgers. Um, so it was exciting, man. It was like a big deal. And, and to boot, I was gonna get paid, like, probably 50 bucks or something, but dang, man, I was getting 50 bucks I'm to 10th grade working a, you know, slimy pizza job for Domino's. Um, that my dad got me, by the way. Um, <laughs> pulling strings. Um, and so I, I was, you know, all about it. And I went and I played and Tommy Lasorda got on stage and he shook a tambourine with me and he said, look at the kid on the drums. You know, these were like adults. These were like 20 somethings that I was playing with. And I was 14, 15 years old. So I was psyched, man, it was great. Got paid at the end of the gig. It was a check. I had no checking account. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> Should have saved it, but I'm pretty sure I gave it to my mom and she gave me 50 bucks. So, mm. so that was your first real gig. How, how active were you uh, during those high school years uh, gigging? Were you able to able to, to keep that going or was it a hit and miss type of thing? No, I, I, uh, I did a couple more of the like big band rehearsals. Um, John wouldn't let us necessarily do the gig, but he'd have us at the rehearsal and we would run the rehearsal, like we'd do, we'd play the rehearsal. Um, so I got to do that, you know, it wasn't a paid thing, but, it, but I got to do it. Um, and there were a couple more of those little fall festival things that you make, you know, a little scratch from. Um, and I was very aggressive in uh, trying to get in the club scene in Atlanta. There were two clubs in, in the city. Uh, we were ju juniors in high school at this point. Uh, one was called the Rec Room, that was sort of like the Georgia Tech rock hangout. Uh, and one was called the Sombra Reptile. And these were both just dive bar, sleazy, horrible places that I would never in my life let my kids drive to with their fresh licenses and, and they're, you know, borrowing my car and throwing their gear in there. I, would, I don't know what my parents were thinking. I think they just thought I had it under control because I was pretty confident about it. And I was like, man, I got this gig, it's in the city. And mom never went to the city, so she didn't know. You know, she was safe in the suburbs. She thought I was probably going a couple miles down the road. But I was on 85, like going 80 miles an hour as a 16 year old with a bunch of drums and friends in the car. And we weren't doing drugs or anything, but we were. Great. We weren't paying attention. That's for sure. <laughs> we were all hopped up on Mountain Dew and smoking cigarettes and thinking we were like a big deal. And we would go down and play for 20 people that were our friends that we convinced to come down to the city. And they somehow convinced their parents to let them come down to the city. And uh, we had a great time. Man. It was cool. Never made any money, but we didn't care. So you're playing in the uh, you're playing in the band in high school, and you're doing some gigs, doing in some. Uh, sitting in some rehearsals, uh, how does that change after high school? Um, well, John also gave us the opportunity to teach. So I was doing a bunch of teaching um, of the sort of eighth and ninth graders, the upcoming kids, you know, we were, I was doing rudimental stuff with them and teaching them, you know, basic mallet, uh, you know, the scales of marimba um, and, uh, and heavy, heavy into drumline, like marching percussion. That was like my thing, I loved it. Um, and so, Right after high school, like the thing to do would go be to go straight to drum drum and bugle corps, um, if you were into it, like if you were serious about it. Uh, and we have one in Atlanta called Spirit of Atlanta, and that was like where everybody was heading. That you know from the from the high schools that we were competing with, um, all the like top dogs were going there. So of course I had to go there and audition. And it's this sort of to explain drum and bugle corps. Um, 
It's a summer program, summer youth program, basically. You pay to do it. You pay hundreds of dollars to um, go and audition. Well, you audition, and then if you get accepted, you pay hundreds of dollars. You go to these weekend camps every month, and then it, then you go to um, like two weeks of really intense ev all day rehearsals. These are like 12, 16 hour days, just blowing your knees out and blowing your ears out and uh, practicing to create what is essentially the illusion of perfection. Like it really looks like everything is so precise and so perfect that you can't find the flaw and that there, there's tenths of points that these uh, kids are from, what, it starts at 13 to 21, are, um, are judged on. So there's like five or six judges on the field. It's all brass and color guard and drum line and you know, front ensemble percussion. Um, there's like five or six judges on the field judging them on you know, precision, marching technique, um, musicality, uh, show uh, accessibility, you know, what, what the show means. And it's gotten very linear and very, um, uh, it's, it's borrowed a lot of elements from the operatic world, from the um, theater, you know, world, the musical theater world. Um, and it's, it's become this really amazing production on a football field, which is kind of a cool uh, juxtaposition, I guess. You know, this, this place where these barbarians like just collide into each other and it's exciting to watch. It's like a Roman, you know, display of like just feasting on each other uh, is the same arena for this beautiful, um, artistic, um, high level performance art, you know. Um, so I did that for two years, and then um, I did an indoor version of that for a couple of years, uh, which is just percussion, and it's marching percussion, but it's on a basketball court, another funny juxtaposition. Um, and uh, got really into teaching high school drumline. Um, so coming out of high school, I basically stayed in the scene, uh, the high school scene, and taught you know, a bunch of uh, high school percussion sections around the southeast and uh, got a lot of cool opportunities out of that, and made money doing that, you know, it was nice. I didn't have to ha keep the pizza job forever, you know. <laughs> I was able to, to do music and, and teach. Do you still keep in touch with Spirit of Atlanta, or do you do anything with them? Um, I'm on the alumni feed on their Facebook page. Um, <laughs> I, it's a big, dramatic, subculture world that if you're not involved in, seems very trite and silly. Um, but to the people that are involved in it, it's very important, it means a lot, and um, those two years for me were, Spirit was in a really weird place uh, organizationally. The administration was kind of uh, falling apart and we were, as kids, you know, we were just trying to keep the dream alive and do drum corps and we just wanted to practice and play and be the best. Um, but we were coming in like 17th place out of, you know, 20. <laughs> you know, we were horrible. Uh, the drum line was really good. The, on, the, the organization was really horrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, a lot of that plays in and factors into your score and, um, you know, how people perceive you. And we had a hard time getting brass players. Like there was a shortage of brass players in the mid-90s, I guess. I don't know. That drought is over because now they're, they're kicking butt. They're top 12 again and they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. um, but I keep in touch with some of the guys I marched with and some of the girls I marched with. Um, but I don't really go to the shows or anything anymore. I'm out of the scene. Yeah, I don't teach the percussion sections anymore. Mm -hmm. Done with that. Well, you mentioned teaching. Was that, was that something that you were considering doing as a, as a major part, or was it always you were a gigging musician and you taught on the side? How did, how did teaching fit in that equation? Um, I, I, I was... Uh, confused after high school because I really wanted to just be, I wanted to go to Berkeley College of Music, first of all. I had a, a glowing recommendation from my drum corps uh, instructor. He had written Casey Shirell, the then drum set instructor at Berkeley, had written him uh, a recommendation for me and there was acceptance and there was, you know, come on. And then there was the financial part, which I didn't understand and my parents didn't understand. They didn't go to college and, and uh, I don't think um, student loans and, and opportunities like that were as transparent at that time, or they weren't as easy to navigate. They were there. I just didn't know how to get around it or do it. So I just like kind of, okay, I put that to the side. And I had a couple of people tell me, oh man, don't go to Berkeley. Don't go to music school, man. It'll ruin you. It'll, you'll hate it. Mm -hmm. you, you, won't, you won't be uh, as organic as, you're, as you are right now. And, and I was, you know, I had a little hippie in me, so I was like, oh yeah, man, you're right. I, I don't need to do that. You know, that's that's kind of the man kind of go into the system, man. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I, uh, so I neglected to follow through with that. And um, uh, college in general just seemed like a waste. Like, oh man, I'll just be in the classroom all the time. And I'm learning this stuff. I'm learning it through drum corps. I'm learning it through doing it. Um, and in hindsight, should have pursued college a little more uh, aggressively. But whatever, we all make our choices. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I, I figured at some point I had to get a real job or, well, that's what my, my folks figured, um, and, uh, just to kind of supplement, you know, and, and, and keep the income coming in. But there was never a doubt in my mind that eventually I wouldn't need that because I was going to be a rock star and I was going to be in this huge, we were going to be playing arenas. And I had this date set for myself when I was 25. It was when it was all going to happen. It was going to go down just like I planned it and it was going to be amazing. And, and things were kind of heading in that direction, but I was, um, I was not, you know, I think going to college would have facilitated that a little easier than not. I was mistaken. Um, and, uh, and, and probably high. <laughs> I was smoking a lot of weed at that point. So I just like let college go, man. Forget it. Hassling me. So if things were moving in that direction, who are you, who are you playing with? Who was... Uh... What, 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 who um, was moving in that direction? I was starting to session a little bit. I was doing some recordings, um, a couple of recordings for friends. I were recording acoustic albums or whatever, and so they wanted drums, and they would ask me to go in and go in the studio and play, play some drums, and I didn't think about charging or anything with my buddies, so I just went in and did these sessions and got exposure to um, the studio work and how that, how that operated, I think, on, a, on sort of a small level, on a small scale. Um, and I was playing, I was getting calls, more and more calls to play in these cover bands. And I was playing in this band that at the time I thought um, had a lot of marketability. Um, and uh, that band was called Sprout and it was out of Atlanta. And we had this singer that was doing this singing and rapping thing. He was this dready kid from, uh, from the inner city and he was awesome. He was a good friend and uh, he was super talented, um, just naturally gifted, great singer. Um, and wrote some, some really uh, thoughtful lyrics, I thought, uh, about his experiences in life. And that was what was cool right then. You know, there was this, there was this uh, in, in the, in the uh, popular music genre, there was a uh, sort of a crossover of rock and roll and rap that was happening, um, thanks to a few notable bands. Um, and we were right there with it, and people were impressed by what we were doing. And, um, I met a guy, I started working at Starbucks around that time, um, getting exposure to the coffee world too. But uh, I was making some money uh, working at Starbucks and meeting people, like networking. Um, I met a guy from RCA that worked for the RCA uh, record uh, division in Atlanta named Louis Newman. And Louis was this, you know, short, uh, uh, tinted sunglass wearing Jewish dude that just seemed to fit the part. And I was like, this is the guy, I mean, right? This, this is what you see, this Hollywood, there's all these little Jewish guys running around with tinted glasses, just calling the shots and smoking cigars. And he was that guy to a T. And, and took a shining to me, liked me a lot. And uh, we had a couple of meetings and I brought him these records and he started asking me about angle and market and what, what I thought our demographic was. And I was like, well, everybody, you know, I didn't understand what he was asking me really. Um, and uh, it, nothing came of it, you know. I, I had high hopes. I got, here we go. It's 25's coming. I'm going to right on target. Uh, and nothing came of it. Um, so it was, uh, I was starting to get a little, you know, some pretty serious life lessons, I think, um, in, the, in the, the world, how the world worked, um, certainly how the entertainment industry worked because um, it was just kind of disappointment after disappointment. This thing's going to happen for you. Man, it'll be great exposure. You guys should come play this gig. We can't pay anything, but look at all the people you're going to play for. I played Music Midtown a few times, and, you know, wow, this is, here we go. And then nothing. And the car never started. I never moved forward. Parking brake was on. Well, you're here now. So eventually yeah. the car started moving in some kind of direction. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened what happened with that group? What what led um, you to that? That group just split up as groups do when when you you know put out a couple of records and and you don't get any you know people get frustrated uh, people grow uh, the, a couple of the guys that were older than I was uh, they were ready to move on and just get on with life one of them got married you know classic 
classic story. Um, <laughs> you know. uh, and so, and I was starting to venture off and do other bands and audition for other bands and see what worked and what didn't. And um, let's see, where are we now? Twenty two, twenty three, something like that. Oh, oh no. So uh, I got a call from a friend of mine to go to Alaska, and this, I was twenty two, and and do this house gig, and um, it was going to be three or four months, and we were going to make all this money and be this band that played five nights a week in this club. Um, and and the, 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 um, the, the, words, the word choices are important here because I heard all this money, I heard club and house band and Alaska, these amazing experiences where the Iditarod ends, you know, this huge nationally known dog, uh, dog race, basically. It all just sounded very cool, and I'd seen that on TV. I don't know, I'd be on the TV. So the words you used were important because it, it sort of convinced me that this was like a big step. <laughs> okay, here's what happened. Actually, we made three hundred and fifty dollars a week, which you know that's a night's pay, really. Um, we lived in this really ramshackle shotgun band house that was disgusting and <laughs> dirty and horrible. Um, the band was terrible. Um, we just, we played covers, you know, rock and roll covers. And the club was actually a bar, uh, and it was seated about 60 or 70 people. And most of those people were just drunk locals, just alcoholic, horrible, lost soul locals, man. It was the saddest six months. We stayed longer. Um, a musical experience uh, of my career. However, I practiced a lot. I got time to, uh, I spent a lot of time singing and drumming and um, uh, practicing with, a, you know, <clears throat> with or without the band. I would go in on my own and practice. I just used that time to really kind of get it together and figure out what I was doing and, um, and see some of the most gorgeous landscape I've ever seen in my life. Um, so that was pretty cool. It was a real spiritual um, connection to uh, how big the world is and, and what's really going on and saw grizzly bears and muskox and moose and uh, the northern lights. Um, Aurora Borealis like, is, is the most magical thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, so that was cool. What prompted you, uh, the band, to stay longer? Money. They, <laughs> you know, I, just, I was like, I was, I was 22. I didn't care. I was like, cool, man. We're having a good time. I'm making good friends out here, which I did. made some really good friends. Um, and nothing to really go back to except my Starbucks job. There was no band waiting or anything. Um, so we just decided to stay a little bit longer and see what came of it. They wanted to start doing USO tours as well. Um, so that was on the books for September. Um, and by the end of the six months, I was so tired of all those people. I was like, I cannot get on a boat with you and entertain GIs for even, you know, I mean, it was a, a better gig and better money, but I just, I was not interested in staying around those people. Uh, by the end of that six months. It was super dysfunctional. It was like a horrible dysfunctional family. It would have made a great reality TV show. But, and we were called the Fumblebees. Did I mention that? <laughs> no. Is that the best name you've ever heard for a band in your life? <laughs> the Fumblebees. And hearing a uh, really intoxicated Inuit try and say Fumblebees and request Bobby McGee by Janis Joplin one more time <laughs> was going to send me over the edge. <laughs> so I had to get out of there. And I did. So, so, so you escaped, and other other than you know the soul crushing experience of being there, what, what, what is there any other reasons why you left? Was there something that prompted the the move? Um, well, just seeing seeing the world, seeing what was out there, you know, getting a chance to travel, and and um, I had traveled a little bit, you know, I hadn't I'd been out west a couple of times with some friends to go. I had a buddy working in um, uh, what was it? Uh, not Yosemite. But um, uh, he was working in a national park out there, similar Zion. to Yosemite. And uh, the trees and the forest and all the stuff, mm. it was huge, man. The West Coast is just enormous. Um, and it was really exciting to be there and see that. So the opportunity to go even further west and north was very intriguing. So I just wanted to see it. Mm. So uh, uh, how did you come back? What happened when you came back? I uh, went straight for Athens. I had a girlfriend in Athens. Um, I had a girlfriend the whole time I was in Alaska. Um, and was uh, completely faithful to her, and uh, despite all the, 
all the opportunities that presented all, themselves all, all at the three o'clock minutes. in the morning <laughs> um, in the, the bar out, you know, 50 miles outside of town. Um, I, uh, I just came straight to her and straight to here. Um, and uh, I had a, a couple of really good friends here that were playing music, particular, uh, specifically uh, a trumpet player named Mike Elam, who was in the master's program here. He was doing a lot of design work for the marching band, and he was um, actively playing around town. And, and uh, he told me how cool it was and how great people were. And I knew a couple people already that were playing here, so I just came straight to Athens and uh, jumped in, man. Joined a band and started touring and filled up the Georgia Theater a bunch of times and thought, <laughs> okay, now it's good. Now it's, now it's good. I'm still on my timeline. I'm 23 now. 25's coming, and this band is totally going to make it. And by make it, I mean fill up, you know, arenas or whatever my starry-eyed vision was for that time. Um, I just, I measured success by how many seats were in the audience, you know, how many butts were in the seats or whatever. Um, and, and how many people were singing along the lyrics to the songs that he wrote and uh, how many bras were getting thrown at you, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, how much money you were making and how many, you know, success to me was that. It was the rock star dream. The, the true like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was romantic, as you know, as I said before, to, to this little Christian kid that had never been exposed to this stuff. And naive as I was, uh, even then, certainly then, um, I was ready for it, man. I was ready for it to happen. And so I lived, tried to live these you know, part of that lifestyle as much as I could. Certainly got into the drugs and and the partying aspect of it. The sex part, man, I was very nervous and shy and I had a girlfriend and I was faithful to her and so I wasn't the crazy like sleep around on the road guy. Um, and then the, you know, the rock and roll element was there. I was, I was super rock and roll, man, I could play and I was in a killer rock band and people were digging us until we started touring, you know. Then you start touring and you get out into different cities and different clubs and 20 people show up, maybe five people mm -hmm. show up. Maybe you get lucky and you open for a band that's got a great crowd, and that happened a few times. But yeah, after a few years of that, I was like, okay, I'm 26. I missed my time. Oh, God, no. <laughs> it's okay. There's still time. Um, but uh, you know that that band sort of eventually just sort of crumbled as well. And I was actively gigging um, in in the the small but burgeoning jazz scene in Athens. I was getting to play with some really really great players here in town who are uh, still playing and still active. So that was cool. What was the name of the band that you first started with whenever you came back? The Fuzzy Sprouts. The Fuzzy Sprouts. Fuzzy Sprouts. So the man. Sprouts had turned fuzzy. <laughs> What's that? I, said, cause I, I recall you said that the other band was named Sprout. Sprout. Yeah, yeah. So how, how odd is that? <laughs> and, um, and in fact, when that band Sprout came and played Athens, we played at DT's Down Under, which was this underground little cavernous uh, uh, club and across the street at the Georgia Theater that night the Fuzzy Sprouts were playing and I remember us joking and jiving about man what's up with those guys <laughs> I bet they're lame you know <laughs> and then however many three four years later you know I'm in that band like really in that band involved in that band we were a three-piece um, we did some really cool vocal stuff and we did a uh, sort of mix of genres you know we did a lot of rock a lot of funk a lot of punk um, and then in sort of some jam band. Jam band was, was on the, was the, the thing at that time. You know, mm. Fish and, and Widespread Panic was huge and um, these little subsets of, of um, jam bands from around the country were, were just nailing it at that time. And so that we sort of eased into that scene a little bit. We were, we were outsiders to that scene. We weren't doing enough of the noodly kind of stuff for them. You know, our songs had more structure and form and uh, we're a little more intense, I think, for those poor kids, um, and they weren't <laughs> into it or ready for it. Uh, but it was fun. We had a great time. Party a lot. So you were both starting to become involved in the jazz scene, but you also had the Fuzzy Sprouts going at the same time. Mm -hmm. What was uh, what were the places that you played, and were the, was there any crossover in venues for where the Fuzzy Sprouts were playing? Sure, sure, the... yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the 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 crossover happened, I think, because of that jam band scene. Like it it made it okay for young folks to listen to more sophisticated music. Um, in that, like guys like Medeski, Martin, and Wood were doing they were doing the underground jazz thing before they were doing the the jam band scene, and they were killer. I remember seeing them in Atlanta when I lived I lived in Chambly for a little while, and I went to. Um, 
this little Georgia State hangout where all the music students went, and it was this out jazz thing. It was my first exposure to sort of avant-garde, um, really you know high-level artistic stuff. Um, and uh, they made it okay for jazz guys to do big club shows um, and to pay money to see these guys, you know, pay 10, 15 bucks to see these really sophisticated, um, seasoned, schooled players. Um, so there was a band called Squat at that time that was um, comprised of Trey Wright, Carl Lindbergh, Carlton Owens, and Tommy Somerville, and they were all Steve Dance prodigies. They were all um, under his tutelage, and Steve was running the you know, jazz program here and really building it up. And we would do shows with them all the time because they were really fun. They took, they didn't take jazz seriously at all. They loved it and they could play the hell out of it. But they had so much fun with it. They would come on stage with dresses or pumpkins on their head or, you know, uh, switch instruments and like do this insane stuff or play like a bluegrass song, you know. And they, they didn't care. They were free and they were open. And it was very exciting to watch and be a part of and see. Um, and I, I longed for that, man, that sort of reckless abandon of just like going full full force into, uh, you know, the, the artistic expression of that music, that style of music, to me was like brilliant and awesome. Um, and they did it, they did it better than anybody and they carved out this great niche for themselves and they were a huge thing around town, you know, in a, in a town that's known for music to be a big deal is kind of a big deal, you know? So they weren't known in other parts of the world so much, but they got to, they got, they, they did get to tour and they did do a lot of great things for, I think, our music community here. Um, and doing shows with them was always fun because of the sort of, you know, the diverse nature of it. Like we were doing this hard, fast rock um, sort of jammy stuff and they were doing this like softer sort of jazz thing, but it was really out and really um, exploratory and cool. Was there a... Uh was there kind of a hierarchy between the different genres? Was there a particular genre that was more or less respected than other ones? Hmm. Um, I would say, yeah, the, the jazz stuff was more respected because uh, obviously those guys spent four years you know, in, co in school, in college, doing their thing and studying. And they knew theory and they knew um, you know, the ins and outs, the real hard, fast rules of music. Whereas in our, our world, it was more like, you know, some of the guys, some of the players in the band knew that stuff, um, and then a lot of the guys were just free flowing, man. They were just doing what was feeling good. You know, it was that kind of that kind of vibe, um, a little more organic, I guess. Um, and uh, so, the jam band players really respected the jazz players and emulated a lot of their stuff. You know, um, and at the same time, the sort of the bluegrass world was seeping into that as well. Mm -hmm. And bluegrass is really a sort of sophisticated technical country music, you know. If you want, I mean, if you want to label it that, I guess um, it's born of of this Appalachian, uh, you know, descent and 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 um, Tennessee hills and, and moonshiners and stuff like that. And that's where a lot of the uh, you know, country music came from, but it was but it was really technical and fast and crazy, and it was seeping into the jam band thing, and so was the jazz world, and so you were getting this like crazy mix of, like now chord progressions that were just specifically designed for this style of music were seeping into this style of music, and uh, and then these guys were taking both of them and jamming them together, and it was cool. It was really neat to to see it all happen, and the people that were doing it really well were were at the higher you know the upper echelon of the of the musical respect scale you know, for, for our world. So would you describe it more as there being separate scenes and that at particular points those scenes were melding or was Athens in general just all these different styles slowly fusing into each other? There were purists in each form, or in each genre, for sure. Um, there were rock and roll people that were just like, man, you know, why are you... <laughs> Why would you even do, uh, you know, a six chord? That's ridiculous. You know, we are one, four, five people. And, you know, uh, and then the bluegrass guys, they're already sort of outcasts. Um, Bill Monroe made bluegrass illegal or something. I don't know. He really offended the Hill people um, because he was doing some really strange stuff and some really different harmonies and really different chord progressions. And then the jazz guys, like there were strict straight ahead guys that thought, you know, the stuff Modesky, Martin, and Wood were doing or the stuff that 
um, squat was doing was an abomination, you know, and, and you can't call that jazz. Don't call that jazz. It's not jazz. Um, jazz is only when you play Miles Davis music or, um, you know, uh, uh, who have John Coltrane or any of those guys. Like, you have to stick to the standards, man. you got to play, which is basically like a cover band, right? <laughs> I mean, um, or, or you're writing original stuff that's sort of steeped in that world. But the stuff Squat was doing was incorporating all, the, all those things. Um, and uh, so there were, there were people on both ends of the spectrum. There were people that were like purists of the form uh, of the genre, and then there were guys, most of us, uh, the people I was in the scene with didn't care and, and were welcomed at all, you know, and really got into it. There was a surge of hand drumming too that uh, sort of drove me crazy in a way, because um, I, I uh, I liked playing hand drums. I thought hand drumming was cool. I did some a bunch of accompaniment for um, the university dance department, the modern dance class. And it was that's a whole different um, story. But uh, there was this surge of like drum circles popping up all over the place. And, and for some reason, drum circles drove me insane. Like I just <laughs> I didn't want it to be that accessible, but I was glad it was that accessible. You know, like I saw people getting joy from it, and, but at the same time, like I'm working really hard over here, man. Like you can't just jump in. You can't, you're not, you're not, don't call yourself a drummer. You're not a drummer. You're not a percussionist. You're a hobbyist, you know, and it is an expensive hobby. I'm sorry, but you have to cut your teeth. I mean, you got to pay your dues a little bit. You can't just jump in. Um, but that was all happening, and it was, it was sort of, uh, it was coming from the, I guess, the jazz world more, uh, the Latin jazz world. So it was borrowing from these Cuban and African influences. And so all of a sudden you've got these um, sort of overprivileged white kids that are, you know, uh, playing calfskin drums and talking about their knowledge of, of uh, Senegalese people and, and the Cuban culture and speaking, you know, Portuguese to you because they went and studied in Brazil for a year because, you know, whatever. I don't know. That, 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 that whole scene just sort of drove me crazy. But, um, but it was neat. It, it was a multicultural thing. It started to, it started to make that okay, you know, um, and, and bring that, um, I think, shed some light on where music really came from, where the, um, where the uh, sort of foundations of rhythm came from, mm. which, which was, was, was cool. You know, I was being a snob, basically. <laughs> um, so jazz had a point of origin here through the university and through some of the older players. And obviously the, the jam rock had a point of origin. What was, was there a point of origin for that Cuban influence or for that Latin American influence? Or was it mostly imported from people who had traveled and came back with it? Um, I think uh, Dr. Arvin Scott, who taught percussion here, he and uh, Dr. McCutcheon, um, were huge advocates of that, you know, and Dr. Scott taught a lot of, he taught a hand drumming class and it was open to anybody could take it. It was, I think it was an elective at that, at that point. Um, and I only knew this because I was hanging out with people that went to college. I didn't actually get to experience it, but Dr. Scott was really cool, man. He, um, he exposed a lot of people to that, that world. And um, uh, I would say if, if it has a point of origin in Athens, it's that, it's his, his influence. He brought that to the university, which was really cool. Good. So we're, we're, we're starting to come towards the end of this time, so I want to I find a, a good point to uh, kind of culminate it, and of course we're going to talk about more things in the next section. But So at this time you're seeing this, this combination of different styles. Um, now has that kind of developed into a unique Athens sound, or is the Athens sound more... Is, is, it, is it more of an undulating thing based upon what new, in, what new influences are coming in different times? What's, sure. What would you describe that sound as? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. I'm, I am, um, I'm excited about the Athens music scene right now because I think all those things did play a role in, um, in where it's at now as far as the integrity of it. You know what I mean? We've gotten past the, um, I, to a certain extent, gotten past the sort of um, hobbyist mindset of like, oh man, I got a guitar for Christmas. I'm going to be in a band and go play and, you know, uh, drive down the price for working musicians. Um, <laughs> uh, and you've gotten, you know, more serious players. Uh, we've, we're, we're 
the jazz scene is, is alive and well in Athens. There's a lot of great young players here that are coming to school. Um, Dave D'Angelo is now at the department. Dave was a really sought after um, session and uh, live uh, player, sax player um, from New York. And so to have his influence here in that, I think has helped a lot. Um, but there's a, a community for for that particular genre, um, and it it is uh, made up of people from a lot of different styles of music. Um, I think uh, like the Americana scene has sort of grown out of that bluegrass jam band thing, you know, which is not so popular anymore. But now it's like bootcut jeans and um, three hundred dollar plaid shirts and stuff that <laughs> has sort of like fed into this really hip Americana scene. There's some great songwriting that's happening. Um, that's, that's one of my favorite aspects of it, is the integrity of songwriting has really um, been raised. Like uh, guys like um, Dave Marr and uh, Don Chambers and um, uh, shoot, Randall Bramlett, man. Uh, they've just, they've made it uh, important for people to listen to lyrical content and, and, and actually say something, not just scribble down some words, which I think you found a lot of in that jam band scene that people would just kind of write down some things. Oh, I saw a mountain and there were trees and it was beautiful and isn't the world great? You know, and they would sing that because it filled a space. Um, now you've got guys writing like really uh, important things down and singing, you know, translating it, singing it through. Um, so I think that, that comes through in the Americana scene. Um, and then uh, there is an art rock world or an art music thing that's happening. It's experimental music, I would say, um, that is uh, really hard to listen to and really strange and, and not palatable for and, uh, for you know mass consumption. But it's it's saying something. You know, it's 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 uh, translating what it is music's supposed to translate, I guess, or mm -hmm. what people think it's supposed to. Um, it's allowing these people to have an outlet to really just express themselves. And um, that came from a guy named Craig Leske, uh, who is uh, not among the living right now. He passed a few years ago. He was working with the drive-by truckers. Um, and uh, he was a huge advocate for experimental music, um, making music from uh, non-conventional music from conventional instruments, you know, or conventional music from non-conventional things, you know, found sound stuff, and it's, that's been cool to see. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's developed into uh, a more accepting community. Uh, it used to be very um, divided, you know. Mm -hmm. There was the 40-watt scene, and there was the Georgia theater scene, and there was the melting point scene, and never the tween shall meet. And now I think you're seeing more of an integration, I think, um, you know, in this day and age of uh, musicians just being cool with each other and going to check each other's shows out and liking the stuff, you know. If you're an indie rocker, you can like jazz or you can like bluegrass or you can, you know, you can go to these shows and it's okay, you know. I think everybody's getting a safe pass. I think we're all over the, um, the sort of uh, musical snobbery that existed heavily in the late 90s. I think mm -hmm. those days are behind us. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much for oh, coming you. today and speaking with us. Absolutely. Thank you.